So welcome everyone to this fascinating uh, performance today, talking about an event that seems unbelievable, um, particularly to those of us who've lived in Vermont. It's hard to imagine the Confederates were actually up here. So we look, excuse me, <coughs> we look forward to Michelle Sherman's talk about this. Uh, Michelle has a long uh, newspaper business history, over 30 years. Uh, she is the production and marketing manager at the Journal Opinion in Bradford, Vermont. She's freelance for magazines and newspapers and spent 25 plus years researching the Underground Railroad and the Civil War. She has published four books, uh, the book that you'll hear about today, a book about slavery and the Underground Railroad in New Hampshire. She's also co-edited a Vermont Hilltown in the Civil War Peachum Storybook. And she travels around Vermont and New Hampshire giving programs, so we're very pleased to welcome you. Welcome, and thank you for coming this afternoon. I'm really excited to be here, and I'm excited to share about this fascinating uh, story of the Civil War that so many don't know about, and um, there's so many facets to it, so I'd, I'm just excited to share. Uh, the St. Albans Raid was a Confederate attack um, in October 1864 in St. Albans, Vermont. But it wasn't a battle. Uh, the, um, Robert E. Lee did not send troops up to Vermont um, to, uh, th this was not one of the battlefields. This was actually a secret mission, and it's one of the most misunderstood and um, misinformed stories of the Civil War. Yes, it was the northernmost action of the Civil War, and it was uh, conducted by Confederate soldiers. So I'll tell you a little, I'll, I'll explain it all. But for so many years since it happened, people thought that um, this was the act of outlaws, rebels, um, bank robbers, that this was personal gain. Um, or the other side of it, um, that Canada was going to get involved while the North was fighting the South and attack from, from Canada down into St. Albans. So there's so many things that have been um, un misunderstood, and the media kind of ran with that. Um, it was headline news in 1864 through to the end of the Civil War. All over the world they were talking about this raid, how horrible the, these rebel raiders had take scared and killed and robbed from innocent citizens uh, but they forgot the stories uh, that were about all of that happening in the south during the civil war the same thing was happening in the south where uh, towns were being destroyed and and uh, people were being killed well these were rebel raiders and the news was um, in england in canada it was just horrible and then once well, I'll give you the ending. They do get caught. <laughs> um, but if you, you know, they do get caught and they did have a trial. Well, this, this just was plastered all over uh, the media. So the misconceptions about the St. Albans raid and what it was have been lost. The facts have been lost for uh, almost 150. 53 years, uh, as well as the information about John Wilkes Booth and Link President Lincoln's assassination. So things, information about John Wilkes Booth and about the assassination and about St. Albans Raiders, these people haven't connected the dots for, for over 150 years. Well, that's what we're going to do today. We, the, the Civil War was a devastating, the, the biggest devastating factor in our country's history, but the assassination of Abraham Lincoln uh, hit our country um, and we had to deal with that. And the other thing about that that we don't understand and has been surfacing in the 20th and the 21st century is that this was a really big cover up. What happened and how Lincoln was assassinated is part of a cover-up scheme to, to protect the Confederate government. So we have to go back, we have to rewind 
well, do we say rewind anymore? <laughs> um, I'm, I'm still VCR age. Um, so go back and figure out what was going wrong and what, what, this, what the roots of this, because the St. Albans raid was not a singular action. It was not a singular um, event. It was all connected. So let's start with dot one, and that would be President Jefferson Davis. In 1864, the Confederacy was losing ground. Uh, the, the war was uh, taxing both sides, Union and Confederate. Um, their resources were depleted. Um, they, were, they had set up prisoner, prisoner camps. They weren't doing exchanges. And the South was not, not winning. And he had to come up with a different plan, something else other than on the battlefield, because it was, it was not going in their favor. The Union was strong. So what Jefferson Davis did was, in early 1864, he sent commissioners and secret agents to Canada. They would travel from Richmond, Virginia, up around to Nova Scotia, Halifax, and then end up in Canada, either, and they uh, set up headquarters in Montreal, and in Toronto. And what they did there, they basically um, would have all the secret agents for the Confederacy, yes there were a secret agents, and they would re be going to Montreal and they would be exchanging mo uh, money with the Canadians so that they could bring uh, gold back down to help fund the war. Well, they set up in different hotels, the St. Lawrence in Montreal, they would rent out like whole, whole floors and this was like Confederate uh, agency right there. And you had commissioners. They, they, uh, I have a couple of the big names, Clement Clay, Jacob Thompson. They were, their job was, um, they were getting orders from Davis. George Sanders was not a commissioner, but he was a sneaky, slimy, really good secret agent. Had a very bad reputation if you're on the opposite side of him. And what were, what, were the rule, what were the rules? What was the commission? Uh, Jefferson Davis uh, gave these agents um, blank commissions. Uh, your top priority is putting the tyrant Lincoln out of the way. Number one, cut off the snake's head and the rest will just wither and die. Um, and these Confederates were to direct they were given directions to set work to undermine anything they could. So they were trying absolutely everything. And this started in 1864. And they were trying things like these commissioners were working in Canada, so they would send agents down into um, the north to do things like they tried to do a prison break at Camp Douglas in Chicago. They tried to do a prison break at um, Johnson Island in Ohio. They thought if we could free our Confederate soldiers that we'd have that many more to send back on the field. These attempts didn't work. And enter an escaped POW from Camp Douglas. This is Bennett Young. He and his, um, his crew, he was part of uh, Captain uh, John Morgan's Raiders. And they were captured in 18... Um, 1864, and they were sent to uh, a Union prison. Well, he and his buddies, they were all from Kentucky, they all escaped. <laughs> they all escaped, and, the, and any, any uh, Confederate soldiers, if they were that far north, if they, were, they would escape to Canada. So he and his buddies were hanging around Toronto going, hey, we need to get back on the battlefield, but we can't get back. So the commissioner started using these guys. They're, it's perfect. They're soldiers. They're stuck here in Canada. Let's use them. Now, um, Bennett Young connected up with the Confederate Commissioner Clement Clay, and he actually traveled to Richmond and talked with the Secretary of War, James Seaton, down at the bottom, and he got a commission. He got a, um, the first commission, and he was made a lieutenant. And his idea was that he was given um, permission to do was, why don't we do raids? That's what Captain John Morgan's famous for. That's all these men are trained for. Um, why don't we raid New England towns? Why don't we get Lincoln panicked if we hit 
along the Canadian border and we hit all these towns, he'll think that Canada's attacking and he'll send troops up and it'll divert some of the, the, um, the strength that is on the battlefields. So the plans for the raid actually started in the summer of 1864 there in Niagara Falls. And there's actually a photo of some of the raiders. Um, well, those are the falls behind them. And the, the planning happened. This was a very detailed thing. It was a commission. It was a military operative. And Bennett Young was 21 years old, and he was given this authority. And he was told, OK, let's, you want to try it out? James Seedon, the Secretary of War, said, I'm going to say, pick 20 guys. Show me what you can do. So he, he did. He picked 20 guys. This isn't, tw this isn't all of them. But he went and he picked all of his buddies from Kentucky. These were, soldier these were, uh, these were friends from um, his childhood. Uh, he knew these people. He knew their families. He also had fought beside them. And they were all from the Morgan um, cavalry. So he knew that they were tried and true. And they all had been, uh, they had all been caught and made prisoners of war as well, and they escaped. So, you know, you've got a good, um, you know, a good resume happening here. Uh, so each one. And they are not nameless. These, I want you to see some faces, but we know who all of them are, but we don't have time to introduce you to everybody. But you do need to know that, that, they, that we do know all of them. And he picked his whatever that was. <laughs> he picked his crew. <laughs> well, did the arrow hit? Did someone shoot it? Nice. <laughs> so, so he had scoped out. He's in Canada. He and um, his, his crew moved over to Montreal and started scoping out uh, targets. And he, tr he came across the border into Burlington, and he scoped that out all undercover, scoped out Malone, checked it came to St. Albans, decided that St. Albans would be the perfect target for the first raid for his, um, his group. And the group was called the um, Fifth Regiment of uh, Retributors. It was retribution because they were going to do what they were going to raid these these cities, these towns, like the Union forces were doing in the South. St. Albans. Why St. Albans? Well, first of all, it's a different place in 1864. In 1864, it is the largest rail cent center between Montreal and Boston. So there are, you see the tracks? I didn't make them look bigger by putting two pictures together. This is actually a wall mural at the St. Albans Museum. They had 27 tracks coming into the, the uh, railroad center in St. Albans. They also had all of these incredible buildings out back because they built rail cars there. So the railroad era had been booming and many of the rail cars were coming from St. Albans. That means that there are about 400, 500 men working there. The other piece de resistance is it's the home of the governor's estate. Now, in the South, if you're a Union force, you're going to burn the governor's mansion when you got to a city and you got to the capital. Well, target right here. Governor Smith. John Gregory Smith and his wife, Ann Brainerd Smith, lived in the towers, and that was right in the center of St. Albans. There we go, N reason number two. And number three, they, he, Bennett Young, when he scoped out St. Albans, found out that Main Street had this incredible park right in the center of town that had Church Street with all the churches, and the school had the park, and then had Main Street that had two banks and a third on the corner and everything was kind of like centered so you could actually take us 21 guys and actually take over this area in the oval well that was the plan that was the plan they decided that this would be the perfect target but they're not going to charge in with the flag on horseback and start you know uh, burning down the town they're not going to do that Bennett Young is going to do it undercover so the beginning of October, they start filtering into town. You have a couple guys 
show up on uh, the, the rail cars and come to town and book a room in one of the local hotels. You have two, three more come by carriage from Burlington. You had some come across uh, into St. Albans Bay on boat. They slowly infiltrated town, a couple at a time. They kind of kept to themselves. They didn't all meet on the green and, and make their battle plans. And they all ended up, the, the first week in October, they ended up being in St. Albans, Bennett Young and his compatriots. They stayed in the local hotels. American House and Tremont House are right on Main Street. Bennett Young was staying at the Tremont House. house. When he would, uh, during the day, he'd sit in the lobby, he would take the Bible out and he would read the scripture out loud. And, all, and he would draw attention. And all the women just thought he was the best thing that, you know, they want their daughters to marry. I mean, he's, here he is. He's, he says he's going to seminary and he's, he's visiting. They, they came to town as tourists. Um, and while during the day, they would mix and mingle. Some of them stayed at the St. Albans house. They would, uh, you know, you'd have dinner and you'd visit and you'd just get to know people. And this was just a really wonderful group of young men that had come to town. Maybe they'll stay. Maybe they'll settle here. We don't know. They checked out hardware stores. They uh, asked about um, the stables. Well, that wasn't on a tourist base. That was uh, reconnaissance. We want to know. They came with no, uh, no getaway vehicles, horses, wagons, nothing. They had nothing with them except they had uh, some weapons hidden back in their hotel rooms, but during the day they would mix and mingle and then secretly meet at, at night at the Tremont ho house where Bennett was staying. This is where the, ra the raid was going to happen and they had to find out all the details. So they fit found out that the best day to hit the banks in town would be on a Wednesday because market day is held on Tuesday where 4,000 people come to St. Albans and sell their wares and people are coming and stocking up and loading it on rail cars because it was market day. Franklin County had an incredible amount of farms and it was the, a huge butter producer. You had 4,000 people come every, when, every Tuesday. That meant that the Franklin County Bank, uh, Frank, Franklin County farmers would go to the bank Tuesday afternoon, so Wednesday, the banks were loaded with money. So the best day would be the quiet day when the banks were bulging. So part of the plans for what Bennett Young um, and his comp compatriots called the Vermont Yankee Scare Party, because that's what they were going to do, is scare the Yankees. So their weapons of choice were their, they were cavalrymen, so they had uh, Colt Navy pistols. They each had two. They had um, extra bullets. Um, these are on display. These items are on display at the St. Albans Museum. Um, so, okay, so they're going to have to steal the horses to get out, get away. They have revolvers. The only thing that they brought with them was um, these glass bottles. They brought about a, a, a box of 40 glass bottles with flammable liquid. It's called Greek fire. You've heard of Greek fire? Okay, Greek fire. This is a, a flammable liquid that goes way back to the Byzantine era. It's something that's, it's like sulfur and phosphorus. It's this mixture that you don't need a match to ignite it. You need impact. So they had this, and the, the best thing about this is that the Confederates had a scientist working on it in Canada who improved the formula from the Roman era through, they decided to improve the formula. So instead of having uh, dynamite or matches or, or anything, or bombs, they had Greek fire. And they each had satchels, and so they would have that as their, um, as um, that was what they were going to burn the town down, burn the governor's estate, target one, and burn Main Street. Well, here's a map again, but the um, green arrows show you where the banks were. First National Bank, the um, Franklin County Bank, and the St. Albans Bank. That's three banks. Originally, the plans from 
the Confederate government end of it was, you're supposed to burn down the town and scare people. But Bennett Young added the whole, let's rob the banks. Okay? Because that just, wouldn't that be great to get all that gold and silver from the Yankees to fight the Yankees? Wouldn't that be awesome? So that's what they thought. Let's, that, all of a sudden we went to that mode because the first stops were not the governor's mansion. They were banks. The red arrows show you where the positioning was. So at night, um, when they were meeting secretly, they were he would have them stationed because the red arrows show you the tops of the streets to Main Street. You need to block those so that no traffic comes up and no people come up and you contain all the action to the public green. The other thing you don't want is over here, remember um, all the 27 um, rail lines that are coming in um, and there are 400 to 500 workers in the rail yard? You don't want any of them finding out that you're attacking and come up with all of their um, daily tools. Uh, <laughs> you don't want them coming armed and attacking you because 400 people versus 21 isn't going to bode very well. So he had, these, he, had so, uh, he had his men, their soldiers, and he, had, he would have them stationed in those red marks. So they set the date, what the, the time. They had their plans. They all had their jobs. You had some that were going to go steal horses. You had um, some that were going to go into the banks. We do know specifically who did what, but we don't need to be that detailed. But we, what we do know is that this raid took half an hour, that on Wednesday, October 19, 1864, the same day as the Battle of Cedar Creek, which the Ver Vermont had the most um, uh, units in that bloody battle uh, that we won, um, the same day, it was a rainy day. It had rained all week. You notice this is not paved, okay? <laughs> no, no blacktop in 1864. Um, it had been raining, and that comes into play. Um, it's also 3 o'clock. That means that the banks are just going to close in, in an hour. The school has not let out, which is on top of the, the public green, so the kids and the parents are all out of the picture. And it's quiet and dreary and not many people on Main Street. So 3 o'clock was the plan. And the uh, soldiers got into place discreetly. No, no um, flags, no uniforms. They got into place. They just kind of wandered. I'm up on King Street. I'm, I'm going to stand right here. And the cue was that Bennett Young walked out of the Tremont House and he walked into the middle of the street. He raised his uh, Colt revolver in the air and he yelled, I take possession of this town in the name of the Confederate States of America. That was the cue. He fired, he fired his revolver and everything happened at once. Simultaneously, the soldiers entered the banks, the Na First National, Franklin County, and the St. Albans Bank. They held people at gunpoint. They threatened anybody that came near the banks. Um, they, they went into the vaults and were ta grabbing whatever they could. They, uh, we have some illustrations here of them holding bank tellers at gunpoint. Um, the bottom one shows uh, one of the, um, the raiders had the bank teller swear allegiance to the Confederate <laughs> government, um, just as a joke. But he, they basically went into the banks and grabbed whatever they could. Now, they're all really young. They're all in their 20s. And no one at plant figured out that bags of gold are heavy. <laughs> And the silver, you know, so when you went in a vault with, with the bank teller and said, so what's that? And he goes, uh, it's pennies. And they'd go, oh, okay, I don't want that. And they literally passed up so much gold because they just grabbed whatever they could. They were grabbing bank notes. They were grab, grabbing uh, some bags, but all they had were satchels. And they were shoving it in there, shoving it in pockets. And so all of this was going on. They stole... $200,000 in this time frame from three different banks. Today, that's six, my son told me what it was, over six million. It's worth six million. 
The only thing they didn't, they didn't understand was that banknotes, there was no federal mint yet. So a Franklin County banknote was only good in Franklin County. So if you went to Burlington, it wouldn't be worth anything. But it still counted as money. Um, they did lock um, Jackson um, Clark, who was a, a Sawyer in, in town. He had come to, to the bank to deposit something. They took it out of his hands, said, thank you, that's for the Confederate government. And they locked him and a teller in one of the bank vaults, screaming like little girls. <laughs> Because they said, we're going to burn this place down. We're burning the city. We're burning it. So as they left the banks, they took the Greek fire. And this is what happens. If you take a bottle of Greek fire and you smash it against a hard surface, boom, it explodes and ignites. It's the impact. It doesn't go out when you put water on it. It gets bigger. The flames get bigger, the smoke, it all gets bigger. But the, the ironic thing is the new mixture they did, the scientists for the Confederates, when the guys got out of the bank and they're going to throw, the, they threw them and, they, and it exploded, all they got was fizzle and smoke because it had been raining and, the, and strangely enough, the water subdued the explosion so there was no real fire. This stuff was used in the New York City um, uh, attacks in, later in November when they tried to burn down 16 hotels in New York City. The Confederates, they used Greek fire. They went in the rooms and threw, threw the Greek bottles of Greek fire. It got, caused a lot of smoke, but it didn't burn a, burn a hotel. Bad stuff. Don't mess with the formula. Anyway, so, so no burning of banks. The banks didn't burn, okay? Um, what is happening at the same time that the banks are being robbed is that anybody on Main Street or near the Common, anybody was that in St. Albans was um, commandeered to the Green. So you had raiders guarding the street and then just threatening them, and they kept them all grouped. Anybody that would come out, they'd hear. There was a photographer, Leonard Cross, heard explosions. He heard all this. You know, what's going on? Did we win the war? Is this a celebration? And he walked out of his uh, apartment house, walked out on the street, and there's Bennett Young riding by on a stolen horse, and he's like, "What happened? Did we win?" And Bennett shoots at him because anybody, you know, then someone grabs him and takes him to the common. So it was scary. It was, it was violence. People were shot at. There was only one person who died out of this, um, and that was uh, Elinus Morrison, who was actually building a five-story hotel in town. And he happened to be alerted that uh, raiders had attacked, and um, he comes running out, and there Bennett Young shot him. He died two days later. And as I said, the formula didn't work. So even trying to throw this against the town hall or anywhere, none of the fires happened. They, Bennett Young's like, forget the governor's um, estate, forget it. it. It's not, you know, we need to get out of town. Let's get gone. We have all these people on the common, all of these residents, um, and Captain George Conger from St. Albans is um, home from um, the war, and he first comes across all of the, uh, the people that are hostage, and um, he escapes. And he's the one that runs through the buildings on Main Street down to the rail yard, and he starts the first posse. He, he starts, tell, telegraph the governor, tell, telegraph, you know, get everybody, grab whatever you've got, and come with me. We've got to stop them. They're taking over our town. Now, the raiders, once they robbed, once they tried to burn things down, and they had horses, Bennett Young was, let's go. They got on horseback, and they rode out of town. Into the sunset. We're headed to Canada, home free. Well, they didn't expect 100 St. Albans guys to be so angry to chase after them. And they were 25 minutes behind them. And this map shows that they went from St. Albans and worked their way up through Sheldon, Enosburg Falls. It was rainy. The horses they stole were not cavalry horses. They were farm animals. And literally, they went about maybe eight miles an hour on horseback. It took them from 3.30 in the afternoon till 8.30 that night to get to Canada. It's a 20-minute ride. <laughs> and I did this 
I actually did this reenactment where you, dr you, know, you drive five miles an hour up the same route and you get a sense of, okay, we're, are we going to get there? <laughs> they did cross the border. They did get to Canada. I mean, literally covered in mud with all the money and all of the stuff they stole. They just got into hotels and guess what? About 20 minutes later, <laughs> the raiders are chasing them. Hopefully that doesn't mess up the mic. <laughs> so they were busted. 21 guys, they, they were able to find 14 of them. And the St. Albans guys, Vermonters, went and arrested them. Wait a second, we're in Canada. <laughs> so the, Can the Canadian police were like, yeah, that's not happening. So they had to actually turn over the raiders. They confiscated $88,000 from the 14 they caught. So who knows what happened to the other. And some of them got away. While they're being arrested that night, October 19th, the governor is alerted by telegraph that um, the rebels have attacked. And this was a poster that it, it was alerting everybody in the state that rebels have come, they're attacking, and we need forces. From October 19th until after the war, Vermont went into a virtual sh uh, lockdown mode. Reign of Terror, it was called in the newspapers, and every town set up a militia in town. In St. Albans, they sent them from Norwich Academy, Bennington, um, all over the state from Derby and Newport, sending forces to, to St. Albans because they thought that the Canadians were attacking. They didn't know who these people were. They thought there were more. And so for months, they stayed on guard. All of Vermont went, under, went into that mode. But we have to talk about the Raiders. The Raiders were in Canada. Fourteen were arrested. Within a couple days, you have your Confederate commissioners get word. They get a message, we've been caught, come help. And um, George Sanders, the, the slimy, sneaky guy from the, the, the agent, he shows up in, in, um, in St. John's and he starts setting up a, de you know, uh, paying off people. So. The Canadian authorities released them, and they gave them back the $88,000 that they had uh, had on their persons, and they let them go. Go ahead, shoo shoo, you know, because Canada was uh, sympathetic to the Confederacy. And they literally let them go because George Sanders paid the judge and paid the police chief. Well, you just wait until they hear about that in England. When they heard about that in England, the message came across, you stupid fools, you're going to start a war with America, the North, Lincoln's North, and we don't want it. So what did they, the, the orders from England were? Go get them. Get them back. Well, they only, could, they only came up with five. So you see the five there, not the guy with the arrow. He was a secret agent, Stephen Cameron. And there's another picture of them. Um, and there's George Sanders in the top, and there's the other agent. They only got five out of 21. These five were arrested, these f again. These five were uh, taken to Montreal because they were going to have a trial. And the Confederate government's going to pay for that. Now, the raiders were in prison. Um, when they were taken from St. John's to Montreal, it was almost like the Patriots winning the Super Bowl. It's like parade time. You've got to see the Raiders because the, Confeder the Confederates were heroes up there. And when they, went to j when they were put in jail, we're not talking about the disgusting jails of 1864. We're talking about like the hotel jail where they had room service and the mayor and the, all, of the, you know, all of the elite in Montreal would bring their young daughters to come and meet the raiders and there's room service and wallpaper on the walls and no rats. This was ridiculous. And they really did have trials from October uh, all the way through to the end of our Civil War. These trials tried to happen, okay? And basically they were trying them as individuals who robbed banks. And the whole time they kept saying, we're soldiers. We're soldiers, and we were on a mission. It was all just a farce, but that was all kept there. Now, we know even through to April 1865 when we won, the, we won the Civil War, the North, 
and the, the war is over, all of a sudden the headlines of what's happening with the Raiders on trial becomes, you know, that's page 17, let's hide it, because this is big news. General Lee surrenders. And the war has ended. But we don't even get to celebrate because only four days later, a President Abraham Lincoln is shot. He dies April 15th. So all of a sudden, the dynamic, the whole country is turned upside down, um, and the South is licking their wounds. We have the, the capture of the conspirators and of John Wilkes Booth, who we know killed the, um, the president. The arrests are being made. Just remember, five guys up here in Canada, up in the Raiders up here. The big, the, the trials that went on, this is when the dots started coming together and they started drawing them. And, they, and in the trials, if you read the transcripts, you learn that the same, um, the same men who were orchestrating the Confederate Secret Service and John Surratt, who's got the big blue X because remember, he didn't get caught, he escaped. John Surratt, John Wilkes Booth, all of these, Louis Payne, Mary Surratt, all of this, the agents for the Confederacy, the same guys that are orchestrating them were orchestrating Bennett Young, and this grand scheme comes to light during the trials. What's the grand scheme? Jefferson Davis, in the beginning, I said he wanted to undermine the northern uh, government. Lincoln's administration. So he had his agents do these things. New York City, they tried to burn the city down in, on election day. Um, I mentioned the hotels where they used the Greek fire. That was another undercover agent, uh, um, covert action by the Confederacy. They tried to do uh, chemical warfare with yellow fever. And, and send infected clothing to Washington, D.C., so, uh, so that all of everybody in the White House would catch a yellow fever and die. That's all of these things, all of the destroying steamships and um, raiding northern cities, star starving Andersonville um, prison prisoners, all of this was all tactics. All of this was part of the big scheme to win, not on the battlefield, but to destroy Lincoln's administration. Good. And as I said, the same players kept cropping up in my story. I didn't know any of this until I was researching the St. Albans Raid. All of a sudden, I'm reading about Sarah Slater, uh, a.k.a. Kate Thompson, a.k.a. the Lady in the Veil, over there. She's, she's a secret agent that travels from con uh, Montreal down to Washington, D.C. She hangs out with John Wilkes Booth, John Harrison Surratt. She's a secret agent. She also is the one who got the paperwork that said, that was uh, from uh, the Confederate government, said this is a military mission. All of this, this is, this is the expense account for Bennett Young, that yes, this is an approved mission, military. She's the one that delivered that to Montreal. We have the same George Sanders who's sitting in a hotel talking and having a glass of wine with John Wilkes Booth uh, March bef before the assassination. He's the same guy that just ran to St. John's to help out our Raiders. All of this is connected. Why? Because you had this big scheme and the St. Albans Raid was just one piece of it. And it's amazing that in the, 20, in the 20th century and the 21st century, what are we taught? That the Lincoln assassination was done by one crazy actor? that the St. Albans raid is a bunch of, um, you know, renegade, AWOL Confederate soldiers. You're, you're taught that. You're taught that Mary Surratt was just an innocent bystander. No, she was a, a Confederate agent back in Surrattsville when she had a tavern and part of the Secret Service in 1850. All of these things were coming out in the trial, and guess what? The Confederate uh, agents started propaganda. George Sanders is sending information to newspapers and all over saying, Jefferson Davis didn't have anything to do with this. This had nothing to do with the government. This is all individual people doing this stuff. They started the propaganda splash during the trials in July, June and July of 1865. 
those truths, Dr. Samuel Mudd just happened to be a doctor who was doing his, his uh, you know, his duty. No, he was a secret agent along with the rest of them. All of it's documented. It's all in the trials. It's fascinating. The big cover-up is we all were taught this from 1865 till the 21st century. It's amazing. So I re you, get, you can research the Confederate Secret Service. It's amazing. But here we are. We have two Confederate undercover operations that happened from Canada only because they were geographically in Canada. The St. Albans raid did work. It was a fiasco, but it did work. It scared all of the Yankees, didn't it? It scared Vermont for over six months. Um, it did, they did rob, so that money went into, back into Confederate, uh, went to Confederate coffers. And on the other side, Lincoln was shot. He was supposed to have been kidnapped. Well, they did shoot him. Those are two operations that actually were successful in a weird way. But the thing about this story is that I started out with just this 30-minute raid. I'm going to research this and tell this really cool story. It's really fascinating. But then this web of, of secret service and agents and, and all this undercover stuff all just wrapped all around it, and I was just enthralled by it. And then when I researched more in St. Albans, I went to the museum, uh, St. Albans Museum, and they were so gracious because I researched this in, the, in uh, 2014, which was the 150th anniversary of the raid. And they were getting ready for their four-day 150th anniversary event. And here I show up going, all right, can I get into your stuff and your files and your pictures? They were so wonderful. But I read uh, personal accounts of a school kid who's looking out the school window and noticing that his mom's down on the common and somebody's got a gun to her head. Or a photographer who gets shot at and the bullet is actually bounces off the, the door jam and onto the street. And I have a picture of that in my book because somebody saved that little piece that looks like a wad of gum, saved it and said this was from the raid and it's in the Vermont Historical Society's coffers. Amazing stories of Vermonters because every Vermonter when October, after October 19th, 1864, every Vermonter got, got on the job. You, we need to protect our state and our towns. And they all did it. And they did it for months where you had farm wives going out and guarding streets and, and the bridge near their house. And then their husband would take turns because they thought that they were going to be attacked again. So the rage showed the, um, this incredible um, human nature of we're not going to take it lying down. And it was just amazing the human nature that I found and what they did in response. We're not going to just cower because, oh my gosh, we're being attacked by the Confederates way up here in Vermont. No, they stood up and said, you're not going to take us by surprise anymore. And that's what I found in this story. So there's so many heroes and heroines that that um, came from that. And I'm so glad that I could share this. And I want you to um, look into all of the, the web because that's just like a whole other bookshelf of, of stories. So thank you very much for having me. Um, and I do have inf information about the St. Albans Museum. Um, this has been on the Mysteries at the Museum um, Travel Channel show, and I've done the segment. Um, so that's in syndication. So every so often the Rubik's Cube episode comes up and that's mine uh, because I'm on that show. Uh, and it's just a great story um, and it's a Vermont story. So thank you very much for listening and I hope that um, you learned something.